From 12 News, this is Newsmakers. Welcome to Newsmakers, I'm Tim White. After eight years in office, Providence Mayor Jorge Alorza is moving on. He served two full terms and must step down because of term limits. Alorza's tenure was not an easy one. He led the city through a pandemic, an ongoing pension crisis, and a state takeover of the underperforming Providence public school system. My colleague Steph Machado sat down with Alorza in his city hall office to look back at those eight years and look ahead to what's next. Mayor, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down for what, you know, may be our last interview as, with you as mayor, of course. Um, so I just want to ask you first, you've been in office for eight years now. What is your proudest achievement as mayor? Huh. Um, so to be honest with you, I, you know, I haven't entered like reflection mode yet. Um, we've been working right up until the very end. Um, but when I think about all the changes that I've, that, you know, we've seen in the city, um, there's just a lot to look back and be proud of. You look at all of the economic development, what we've done to professionalize City Hall. Uh, you look at uh, the programs that we have for young people. You have record low crime. You have just like what we've done with our park system. Um, you know, I look back and like there's a deep sense of like pride and satisfaction in the job that we've done. So maybe you haven't decided on your proudest achievement, but can you just give one example? Sure. You know, you know, as a sort of, you know, 30,000 feet, um, I'm really proud that, you know, I've run the city with honesty and integrity. And, uh, um, you know, that still means something here, here in Providence. Um, and it's really, really important. Um, I'm also really proud of how we've professionalized the way that city government works. You know, you go from maybe 30 or 40 years ago um, not just here in Providence, but frankly, almost every city. Um, the whole point of politics was to run a patronage system. And, uh, you know, I'm not the first mayor to turn away from that for sure. But the city during my time has definitely taken a great leap forward in just um, professionalizing our systems, like instituting processes, you know, hiring, you know, qualified, competent, hardworking, honest people putting them in important positions and letting them do, do good work. So, you know, professionalizing our work is what has allowed us to accomplish so much in so many different areas. Um, and then the last thing that I'm really proud of is, like, my brand of politics. You know, I've been in politics for eight years now, but to this day I don't consider myself a politician. Um, I came into public service because I wanted to tackle thorny problems and, and find solutions for them. And, uh, you know, I've always tackled the biggest and the, uh, the biggest issues, even when they're politically hard. And uh, in my calculus of what to do and what to take on, it's always been driven by what are the biggest needs of the community. And then the political calculation comes later, if at all. Um, but the point is uh, to solve problems. And I've always, I've never shied away from tackling problems, uh, particularly the difficult ones. And what is something that you regret? So. You know, people have asked me, would you do it all the same? Would you do it all different? Truth is that I would do it all the same and I would do it all different. Um, it, it's hard to explain, but they're both, they're both true at the same time. You know, I've learned so much about, uh, about the job, about leadership, about public service, and I've grown a lot during my time, during my time in office. And so, um, you, know, you know, if I were to do it all again, um, I think I would, you know, I would be very proud if it all turned out the way that it has turned out. Uh, while at the same time, there are things you know and you know things you pick up over time uh, that um, you know you wish you knew coming in. And I'll I'll give you an example. So you know that I didn't come into come into office with a political background, and uh, there there's a lot that I had to learn, especially in that first like year or so about um, uh, um, uh, about dealing with and working with um, personalities that exist in politics. I came in thinking that all you had to do was be reasonable and uh, you know that that would that would that would be the expectation and that's it. Um, but there are folks who want a little special treatment um, and uh, um, you know, they can stand in the way of you're doing a good thing if, you know, they don't receive the right treatment. 
And so, so that's something that you know, I learned during the first year. The flip side of it is that you know, sometimes coming in without knowing those things um, are our benefit. So I came in and I made some changes right away that someone who knew the political consequences or knew the potential political consequences would not have done. Would not have done because it was too politically risky. And so... Such as? So I think the big thing right off the bat, if you remember when I changed the shift schedule uh, with, the, with the firefighters, um, so you know, that became you know, a running dispute for about, for about two years. And it was just like constant, constant um, social media, in person. Um, but at the same time, when you look at the end result of it all, you know, the city saved by this point, like tens of millions of dollars as a result of it. And so... So you don't regret anything about that dispute? Because you did end up moving back to the previous number of platoons. Uh, but we were able to lower minimum manning. And so lowering minimum manning from 94 to 88, that's a saving in and of itself of about 2.4, 2.5 million dollars. That's structural savings. Um, so I'll tell you, when we, when we signed that contract, Part of the agreement on both sides was that nobody would gloat. Nobody would spike the football. So that's fine. We know we were doing good work and that the end result was really positive for the city. And so, you know, we, we left it at that. The numbers, they speak for themselves. Uh, but that's an example, you know, someone coming in who does fully see all of the, you know, all of the potential political consequences probably would never have taken that step. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I took that step and it worked out very well for the city. You will always be the mayor who lost control of the Providence School. Gave up control of the public school. You supported it, right? Uh, so you. Well, I didn't just yeah. support it. So, um, sec uh, Governor Raimondo and I, uh, we sat down, uh, we had lunch, and, uh, you know, we, we were there to talk about education. She said that she had heard that our middle schools were in really bad shape, and she proposed that the state take over three or four middle schools. I told her that I was only interested in going this route if we did the whole shebang, if we did the entire school department, because as I saw it, the problem was the contract. So the state could take over three schools, but unless the contract wasn't addressed, many of the structural changes that we, need to, that we needed to make would never come about. And so, you know, that was me bringing it to the table. You gave up control of the schools. That's right. You have since been pretty critical of how the state takeover is going. I think the number one issue that, that you've uh, been concerned about, of course, is the teacher's contract. Uh, so do you regret supporting the takeover or even pushing for the takeover now that you've seen how the first few years are going? No, and I'll tell you why. So um, the... The alternative is not much better. Right? Our schools have been failing our kids for 40 years, and doing nothing is, is simply not an option. You know, as you mentioned, um, yes, I was and remain really critical and really disappointed that when the new governor came in, he made all the concessions to the unions, and um, you know, it really is abandoning our kids, something that is just unforgivable. Um, and so, uh, I, 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 you know, I think that our, our kids were betrayed. Uh, with that said, you know, we've pushed this issue forward, and uh, there is a much deeper understanding in public education today that, you know, our schools need a radical transformation. Nipping around the margins and changes at the, uh, at the edges, that's not going to cut it. We need a wholesale transformation of our schools. and. Uh, um, you know, that's why we propose coming in and rewriting the contract so it's a contract that works for kids. Now that we don't have that, there is no chance or no possibility of us going back to the way that things were because that doesn't solve things. Now we have to go that next step. We need to continue to push the issue. What are the options available to us to bring about that transformation for our kids? And that's why, you know, I stood up here with, with, with two other mayors and said, Look, work with the unions and, uh, you know, have them make the deep concessions that are necessary. And if they don't make those concessions, well, then that's fine. But then pursue a charterization option. Just go to a full charter, uh, charter model. And the idea is not necessarily to go from one to the other um, the next day, 
But the idea is to let the general public know that we actually have options. The fact that our schools have been failing our kids for 40 years does not mean we have to resign ourselves to them failing our kids for another 40 years. And unless we get the changes that allow us to turn this around, well then let's pursue the options that we have. At the beginning of the day and the end of the day, all that matters is are we delivering a high quality education for our kids? And if the answer is no, then the, the, we have to push and we find out, well, how is it that we're going to bring that about? And that's what I've consistently done. You really think it's realistic, though, your proposal to maybe go to an all-charter district? We're going to get rid of the entire Providence Public School District and the teachers will go to other districts where they feel more respected? And then what do we have? What teachers do we have to teach the kids? So, you know, it's a, it's a vision. And the idea is to open the public's minds around what is possible. Right. What we have today is not the only, you know, is not the only um, possible outcome. There, um, there, there are options available to us. And uh, while I don't think it's realistic that from one day to the next this will happen, but if we have a conversation around, you know, turning traditional public schools into into charter schools, well then, perhaps we can start by, you know, taking, you know, historically woefully underperforming schools one at a time. And, uh, uh, you know, let's say we start with the worst of the worst. And uh, we phase out one school, in the, one traditional school, and in its place, in the same building, we start up a charter school that's able to start from scratch and start, and start anew. And the idea is to, um, you know, expand the range of options that we believe we have, and for us to push our, push our imagination as to what's possible in public education. Uh, because, you know, the reality is that the house is on fire on education and it's been on fire for 40 years and I hope that through my actions and actions of others that we continue to push this to the forefront and, uh, um, and instill this sense of urgency around the changes that we need in education and I don't think anyone can say that I've acted with anything less than absolute urgency with our schools. You mentioned Governor McKee earlier when you talk about the teacher's contract. Do you blame Governor McKee more than Commissioner Infante Green when it comes to how the state takeover is going? Well, whoever it is that like signed or authorized the signature of that contract. She signed it. Yeah, um, so, so whoever it is that signed or authorized, whatever. All I know is that um, the state had an opportunity to radically transform the structure under which um, our, our schools are governed, and it refused to take that to take that choice. And uh, you know, as I've said many times, it was a it was a backroom deal in plain sight. Uh, you make concessions to the unions, and you know, teachers statewide will support you in your next in your next election. It was a bare naked political play, and something that clashes fundamentally with the way that I go about governing, which is what's the problem what's the solution rather than take into account the political considerations. Do you think you'll send your son to Providence Public Schools? Absolutely not and it hurts me to say that. You know I was one of these like you know never die like absolutely public schools um, and my wife and I have had this conversation. It's difficult for both of us to have reached that conclusion um, but the reality is that um, while most teachers in fact like you know, a, a, a super majority of teachers out there are awesome. They're fantastic. The chances that my child or any, any one of our parents' child at some point in the 13 years from K to 12, the chances that they're going to have a bad teacher one of those years is very, very high. And, uh, you know, you just can't afford your child losing, losing a full year. Um, and so, you know, um, you know, we would love to have a, a public, a traditional public school department uh, where we'd be very happy to send our kids. Um, but um, the reality is that you know, there are very, very few paths within the traditional public schools where your kid doesn't have, um, isn't in a bad situation for at least one of their years. And I mean, how does that feel? You, you've been the mayor of this city for eight years and you don't feel like your own child could thrive in the school system. I guess, how do you feel leaving office with that being the situation? Yeah, you know, it, it, it absolutely feels like unfinished business. And that's part of the reason why we stood here and did the press conference with the incoming mayor. 
you know, when I became mayor, um, you know, more than anything else, what I wanted to do was turn around our public schools. What I came to realize is that there is no mayor, there is no superintendent, there is no principal that can turn around our schools. It's not about individuals. You can't bring in superman or superwoman to turn around schools. The problems are structural. And unless you address those structural challenges, nothing's gonna fundamentally change. When I saw that, that's when I brought in the state to make, take, the, take the step at, uh, uh, for the structural changes to the contract. Um, unfortunately, that didn't happen. And now we're left uh, trying, to, uh, trying to push for the other structural changes that are within our control and are within our, our actual options to us. And that's where the charter school conversation comes in. But just to wrap up, are you thinking for your son, charter school, private school? We will be applying to, to the charter schools. And uh, if he doesn't get into a charter school, well, we'll figure out a way to send him to private schools. You know, and uh, on this point, you know, what we want for every parent in Providence is what every family with means already has. Families with means, they exercise choice every day. They move to districts with better public school departments. They send their kids to private schools. They do tutoring, they do homeschooling. There are choices and options for families with means. And that's all we want for families without means as well. Um, I want to ask you about your reparations program that you championed during your second term and that recently passed. Um, it's gotten some national attention lately because um, it is going to be open to people of all races, including white people, which is not what we traditionally think of. We think of reparations, depending on if they live in a certain neighborhood or have a certain income. When I reported this, frankly, over the summer, I got a call from someone on the Reparations Commission who said, no, this money is just for people who are black or indigenous. But that is not, and I understand it's a legal issue with the ARPA money that you were not able to limit reparations to certain races. What is your reaction to some of the criticism you've gotten lately for that? Yeah, so this is something that the, that the commission, they talked about and, uh, and looked at very, very closely. And uh, I think that going into, into the work, everyone wanted the investments to be made in a race-based way, not in a race-neutral way, but in a race-based way. Um, uh, but I think that what convinced the committee to do otherwise was that um, if we did it in a race-based way, it was virtually certain that we would find ourselves in court. And even if we went to court and ultimately won, that would be like two or three years down the line. And uh, these investments, they're needed today. And in fact, under the ARPA guidelines, they would need to be spent within about two or three years. So it's that practical consideration that uh, convinced the committee to um, recommend that they be done in a race neutral way. Now, with that said, you know, they were also very clear that they want these investments to help address uh, the racial equity gap. And uh, uh, it was de the investments have been designed in a way that um, you know, I think they're going to accomplish exactly that. So, I mean, I've seen the headlines and sort of it's like juicy and it's kind of clickbait. Um, but, you know, when you see how the investments are ultimately made, I think that's what matters more than anything else. And even if it's not pure race-based, if we're 99% of the way of accomplishing, you know, the, uh, these goals, um, I, think that's, I think that's pretty darn good. Something that um, is still a big issue and is, it was an issue when you came in, is an issue when, when you leave is the unfunded pension liability. Um, more than a billion dollars, it's hung over your entire eight years. You have made many proposals to shore up the pension fund, but if you look at the numbers as we sit here, so January 2015, $281 million in the pension fund. The last investment meeting, October 2022, $365 million in the pension fund, so it's increased about $84 million. Of course, it goes up and down, but huge unfunded liability remains. Is this a failure of your administration? <laughs> so, you know, when you look at what we've done with the finances, um, where we inherited the city and where we are right now, I think there's no one out there who will say that, you know, we weren't not only you know, financially and fiscally responsible, but um, you know, we've turned the city's finances around. So the issue with the pensions is uh, it's not only a ticking time bomb for the future, but it's also uh, uh, an issue that affects our cash flow. 
So pension expenses are growing at about 5%, but our revenue grows at only 2%. So you know, the longer this goes unresolved, uh, the longer um, or the more that things are going to get squeezed out of the, an already strained budget. So uh, go back about five years ago, what I first tried to do was monetize the water supply board. That was going nowhere. Um, we had to go back to the drawing board. And as an example of looking back and always taking on the hard issues, um, you know, we didn't settle for just leaving it there and leaving it for the next administration. And then uh, I proposed the pension bond. Uh, first time I proposed the pension bond, it went nowhere. Um, but we brought it back, sort of. Uh, it was dead but not buried. And uh, we brought it back. And I think that if anyone was taking odds or making bets, no one would have expected that pension bond uh, uh, process to pass. But lo and behold, we built up a coalition. We had a plan in place. And we got it passed by the General Assembly. So um, unfortunately, interest rates have increased since it's passed. So we haven't been able to do the transaction. But we have authorization now for the next five years. So you know, when the, the interest rates drop below a certain rate that they make sense for the city, uh, the next mayor and the next administration, they can take this step without having go, to go through all the hurdles and all the all the steps that we went through. So we've cleared, um, you know, sort of we've cleared the process for them. Um, the transaction still hasn't happened, but once the transaction happens, you know, hoping and assuming that the interest rates are, are going to be there for it, our funded rate will instantly go to about 60% funded, um, and our yearly increase in pension expenses. It's going to go up by 2% each year, and it's going to keep track with our revenues. So it's going to be sustainable, and we won't have the cash flow issues. You say once the transaction happens, of course, we don't know if that's going to be able to happen. You had historic low interest rates for such a large portion of your time as mayor. Looking back, do you wish you had pitched that earlier in your first term? It's something that we've tracked from the very, very beginning. It would not have made, it, made sense during during, the, um, during my first term, I think that after a while, interest rates continue to come down. It's something that we, that we looked into, actually, maybe about three or four times before we actually pursued it. Um, and it just didn't make sense interest rate-wise. There was like this tight window when it began to make sense, and that's when we, and that's when we pushed it. Um, had it gone through the first year, um, then um, you know, we could have taken advantage of the low interest rates. Um, but we came back the next year. And uh, now we've you know, created this runway of five years, or this window of five years. If at any point in the next five years it dips below a certain amount, the city could move forward and they could do so pretty quickly. Um, what are your plans for the next few weeks, the end of your term? Anything specific you're trying to get wrapped up? Are we going to see any, any deals you're negotiating that are going to come out before you leave office? Breaking news. There's a <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll tell you this. So people ask me, you know, are you happy? Are you sad? How does it feel? The truth is that things haven't started to wind down yet. Um, we've had so much going on, and there's still so much to, to do, and then we want to we want to do right by the transition. Think, I think maybe when the when the holiday period comes, and you know, then maybe I'll start you know getting getting you know emotions. Um, but as of right now, it's been nose to the grind. We've been we've been working hard. Um, so, so there's still stuff that we need to that we need to wrap up. I will tell you that um, you know when the president gets inaugurated, and eventually you see the helicopter with the uh, <laughs> ex-president. So I'll be on a minivan. <laughs> yeah, like the PBD chopper taking you away. <laughs> yeah, I'll be on a minivan uh, going skiing. Um, um, but you know, I feel so happy and so proud of all the stuff that we've uh, seen and done in the city. Uh, from our finances being in better shape to crime being way down, the investment that we've seen, our park system, our infrastructure. You know, there's still more work to be done, but you know, I look back and feel really proud of what we've done. You'll attend the inauguration of Mayor Smiley, of I course. assume? Yeah, yeah. Uh, what advice do you have for him as he prepares to take over this office? You know, there, there are a lot of levels of advice. Um, you know, for, for mayor to mayor, um, you know, there are, there are highs and there are lows. Um, I think that you can't get too high when things are going well. You can't get too low when things are going, going poorly. Um, and, uh, um, you know, one of the challenges of this office is that 
um, you know, everything that you do is under, is under a microscope. Uh, an approach that I've taken that has served me well is understanding that you can do a perfect job and you're still going to get criticized. So if you're going to get criticized anyways, might as well do what's right. And uh, to always follow your conscience and do what you think is right as a matter of policy for your city. And uh, the politics, they will come, they will follow. And finally, after you go skiing, where do you think you'll end up next? Still trying to figure it out. Um, I, um, you know, I'm, I'm, looking at, I'm looking at various things. Um, you'll be the first to know once I decide. I appreciate yeah. it. But what I've liked so much about being mayor is that you, know, you jump from one topic to the next, from minute to minute. And I've enjoyed that range of, um, you know, that, that, that range of topics that you work on every day. And uh, um, the, the sort of work life that I want to construct for myself after this is one that preser preserves a range of different projects that I continue to work on, on issues that are really meaningful to me. So do you see yourself practicing law, teaching law, or doing something totally different? Well, I'm trying to avoid real work for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't see myself practicing, practicing law. Um, but you know, I'd like to stay involved uh, with mayors. Um, I'd like to stay involved on education issues. Um, and uh, you know, I want to stay involved in some form or another in the legal profession as well. Do you see yourself ever running for office again? Um, what I can say for sure is that you know, that's not, um, that's not in the plans. Um, you know, you never know what the future holds. Uh, I may rent, run for something, maybe four years, maybe eight years, maybe never. Um, I don't know. Um, you know, the, the reason why I didn't run, you know, this last cycle is, um, you know, I have a four-year-old son. Um, I think my time is best spent and most needed, you know, caring for my family. Um, but if life circumstances um, are such in the future that uh, it makes sense for me to run, and I feel I have something to offer that the moment, that the moment requires, I'll run for office. Uh, but as of right now, it's not actively in the plans. Mayor Lorza, it's been a pleasure covering you these past eight years. Thanks so much for sitting down and taking the time. Thank you. My thanks to Steph Machado. The full interview can be found on her Pulse of Providence page on WPRI.com. We'll see you next week for the penultimate episode of Newsmakers of 22. I'm Tim White. Thanks for watching.